<laughs> all righty let's see if this thing's on i think it is yes hello all um, my name is Hannah Manwiller. I do programs here at Politics of Prose, and I'm very excited to be uh, hosting kind of this event with all of you. Um, this is a book, and this is an author, actually, that we've been really excited to have here for months now. So let's go into quick intros. Javier Zamora is a poet and author. He's going to tell you so much of his story today, and his book will tell you even more, so I don't feel like I need to cover that story as much. Um, but he did immigrate when he was nine years old, and I feel like that's a good starting point. Um, since then, he has a collection of poetry that came out um, in 2017 and is called Unaccompanied. It's beautiful. There's also readings online if you want to listen to him read some of those poems. It's, it's stunning. He has fo fellowships that include Breadloaf, uh, Stegner at Stanford, and Radcliffe at Harvard, and many, many more. But those were the fun ones that I wanted to throw out there for right now. And this is his debut full-length, novel-length book. Um, for the person who's in conversation with him today is Ana Patricia Rodriguez. <laughs> 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 who, if you can't tell, is very local to this area. <laughs> She's an associate professor over at the University of Maryland. Her focus is Latino or Latina um, and Central American literature. She is the author of Dividing the Isthmus, Central American Trans oh, Transnational Histories, Literatures, and Cultures. Um, she also is very active in this community. So there you go. That's all of that. And then for the run of show today, what we're going to start off with is a quick reading. Um, from Javier and then after that they're going to have a discussion about the book about kind of the trajectory of the book what happens in it and other things about that um, one thing to keep a note is that we're going to have a Q&A at the end and I ask that the questions kind of follow the same trajectory about the book about questions about life questions about prior work um, but staying on topic staying on what we are discussing here Thank you so much, and that's everything. I'm going to pass it off to them. Thank you. <clears throat> and thank you all for coming. Um, this is dope. <laughs> y gracias, Ana Patricia, por estar aquí. Um, it's an honor for me to be here. And for those of you who don't no, she has been doing work for us Central Americans forever, and specifically in literature. And I've read your essays, and I'm a huge fan. And now I will just read from the end of chapter one. And the book is told by me as a nine-year-old, and it begins weeks before this day, and it ends the day that I'm reunited with my parents, and it's all in 1999. <clears throat> and this is April 6, 1999. It's dawn, indigo like when mom left. Mali kisses me awake, and I have to get ready. The roosters crow, La Bonita barks, the birds sing, the world is waking up. The stars turn off one by one. To shower, I pull water from a well with a bucket. Grandpa already showered. Abuelita dries me off. Mali irons my clothes. The outfit has been picked out. A nice dress shirt, dark blue dark blue jeans, a black belt, black dress shoes. Next to the hard boiled eggs, avocado, queso duro, and tortillas, a black backpack. Even the brand name has been crossed out. Inside it, a dark t-shirt, black pants, two pairs of underwear, an extra pair of shoes, the plastic toothbrush, a comb, soccer shorts, Colgate toothpaste, a bar of palm olive soap, head and shoulders shampoo, and another dark blue short sleeved dress shirt. There's a notebook, Bic pens, pencils, 
and the assignments my teachers gave me. Everything has to be dark colors, Mali explains. Don Dago's orders. I eat, and Grandpa waits by the door, holding my black backpack and his own regular one. He looks at his watch. Abuelita combs my hair. Mali kneels in front of me to button my shirt. She tucks it in, kisses my forehead. Lupe is here, the earliest I've seen her come visit. She hugs me, kisses me, wishes me luck. Julia is sleeping in Abuelita's bed between two pillows to keep her from falling. Abuelita kisses me, kneels to hug me. Then Mali and Abuelita hug me at the same time. Only now I cry. This is it, the thing I wanted to happen, but it's happening so fast. Te queremos mucho, Chepito. Te cuidas. Que Dios te bendiga, here, everywhere, always. We'll be waiting for you, praying you'll make it there safely, Javiercito. Their voices almost in unison, soft, breaking with every word, tears running down their round faces. I can't stop crying. Then they make the cross over my forehead over my head, over my entire body, wiping my tears with their hands. Grandpa grabs my arm, walks me past the door. Don't look back, he says, but I do. I see Abuelita and Mali in the middle of the door, holding each other. Lupe has a hand on each of their shoulders. Come on. Grandpa says, and we walk. I'm speechless. <laughs> um, first of all, I, I want to thank Javier um, for writing this book. I was already a fan with his first book of poetry. I, I just, you know, thought like, how could he top that, right? <laughs> um, the poetry, the language, the words in the tradition, I think of the exteriorista poets of Centro America, very sparse, but very, you know, you know, he, he just t touching your heart. And so when I um, was asked to um, accompany him, because the title of his poetry book is Unaccompanied in Honor of All the, you know, Child Migrants and Families and Women that, you know, come all the way from Central America fleeing, you know, all, you know, different types of situations um, that, you know, I think it, it, it's due honor here that we're accompanying you, right, on this uh, journey of, um, of, of talking about your book that's been newly published. I mean, the book just came out on September the 6th. So a lot of us have been um, just waiting for this book. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm not, you know, under um, saying that a lot of us have been waiting for this book after, mm -hmm. you know, Unaccompanied came out. So I want to thank Javier for writing this book that I cannot imagine how, how you know, difficult it might have been really to, you know, put all that out there in language and prose in a memoir that often seems like fiction. And we were just talking in the back that, you know, um, the, the, the truths that are in this book are larger than fiction, that sometimes they seem like fiction. But you know, they are no invention. These are the experiences of you know migrants, you know, leaving Centro America, especially child and women migrants and families. So um, it's all here. All these truths are here. So I wanted to start with some questions, but I wanted again just to thank you oh, and to thank you all for it. accompanying us. You know, mm -hmm. in, in this you know hour, it's going to go by really fast. But um, I wanted to start off with a question, and you know, I teach, so of <laughs> course I had to you know write down my questions. More like because my memory is going <laughs> with COVID. But, uh, you know, this is a memoir, right? And um, not an autobiography. And memoirs always, you know, focus on personal experiences and intimacy and emotional truths. And, you know, a person can write m um, memoirs, different memoirs of your own life. You know, um, in other words, you could have three memoirs, four memoirs, because you're telling different truths. 
um, or episodes in your life. So I wanted to ask you, to start off, you know, after you read um, those minutes, what story did you want to tell in your memoir? Hmm. What memories, what emotional truth did you want to capture and relay to us? Hmm. Um, for, you know, I came here when, when I was nine. I came to California and Unaccompanied came out when I was 27. I am 32 now. And for, I started writing, seriously writing this book when I turned 29. And for 20 years, I was running away from trusting this nine-year-old kid. Um, this kid that growing up in the United States and the administrations that we've had with the media coverage that we've had regarding immigrants, they made me be ashamed and also treat this part of me, this nine-year-old kid, like everybody else does, which is a flattening, a flattening of immigrants. We are only our trauma. We're only those days in which we were, you know, close to death or we, our shittiest days of our lives. That's who we are. And so in this, I wanted to show that we are not as flat. We are full human beings and that even when you are at your worst, that you can find joy because that's what survivors do. If you don't find a joy, then you don't make it. As any immigrant would know, you don't make it across. And I guess that I just wanted to tell a fuller picture in, in, in the shorthand of, of that answer. Um, and I wanted to, I know the title is Solito, but what bothered me about Unaccompanied is that my mind at the time when I was 27, my trauma um, didn't allow me to paint a fuller picture, a truer picture that, you know, I didn't make it here by myself. I made it here because of other immigrants who chose to help me along the way. And not all of us make it here on our own. We are here because somebody made a choice to help us along the way. Um, and so that, I, I think, uh, gets forgotten from the headlines and from how the United States treats immigrants. Yes, and you get that fuller picture, you know, by the way you talk about these people that accompanied in your jur journey, right? Mm -hmm. In the ch chapter you read, you're leaving behind the most precious people in your lives, your grandpa, who accomp accompanies you right up to the door, uh, uh, the step of the bus. Mm -hmm. And there's another goodbye there, right? Mm -hmm. Where your grandpa begins to cry, he turns all red, right? Mm -hmm. So what's so beautiful about this book is that he's able to capture that emotional truth through these small details. Mm -hmm. um, you know, small gestures, looks between people, um, you know, what they eat. For example, he comments throughout the book, the tortillas. In mm -hmm. El Salvador, we eat thick tortillas, right? And as he's moving, as they get thinner the northern you go. <laughs> right? They actually do. It's a fucking trip. Uh -huh. <laughs> so you're telling the story of this passage through Mexico through these, you know, s signs, right? Yeah. Tortillas. How, how best to tell it, right? Because tortillas are really close to our hearts. Mm -hmm. um, and they're different. So it, they also mark the difference of, you know, la different Latinos, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, but I want to uh, come back um, because you also tell the story you talk about these people so lovingly in your life. And it begins with the dedication, even before the story. And always pay attention to the dedications. When I read books, I always first go to the acknowledgments. I want to know how you know, people acknowledge the people who have helped them in their journey to produce you know, a book, right? And the dedications. So I, 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 I love the dedication to Solito. He writes, um, uh, um, let me read it to you if you haven't um, read it yet, right? He writes, um, Patricia, Carla, Chino, and all the immigrants I met on my way to the US and never saw again, I wouldn't be here without you, okay? So my question to you, so that maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, those is the, the people, they're not characters, they're real people. Um, could you tell us more about 
these particular people who impacted your lives, along with the people that you know stayed back, like your family. Mm. Um, why did you want to memorialize them in your memoir, body and so forth, right? Um, uh, just to tack on on my previous answer, I would give readings like this for my poetry book, and my poetry book is called Unaccompanied, and the four people, Gino, Patricia, Carla, and myself, out of all of them, my trauma only allowed me to mention Chino once. And I think my poetry book is, is 86 pages. So he appears in one poem. And that, I think, is very telling of where I was in my healing journey. And everybody would come up to me thinking, and this is like 2017, 2018, oh my god, you made it here by yourself. You know, that's when you hear that word, it's like, oh, you made it here by yourself. And it was this, I realized that I was erasing the truth. I was lying and I was erasing these people who really saved my life. And, and getting to know them again was very difficult. I didn't want to, I was running away from them on purpose. My brain wasn't allowing me to, to see them and to make him human because if I made him human, that would you know, send me on a spiral of was what I learned to um, self-soothe. Um, if you've gone through trauma, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and, and so it was a decision to honor them and honor them as best as I could, um, which is concentrating on their little quirks um, that I remember. Um, who they were? They they were from Soyapango. Um, if you know, if you're from El Salvador, Soyapango has always been a dangerous area, and uh, they were fleeing. I didn't want to concentrate. I didn't know as a nine year old why they were fleeing. Um, and they loved each other. Chino was from the same town as Patricia. Chino um, was I want to say eighteen. 18, very skinny, looks like uh, Olivia from Popeye, Popeyes, um, buzzed haircut, um, had tattoos, and he was fleeing. And uh, Patricia must have been like 27 with a 12-year-old 12, 12 daughter. She was super short, probably like 5'1", super skinny, but she had this big personality. Um, Carla was 12. Um, I had a crush on her. There's like the, um, I've never been, um, you know, outside of my home with strangers, and and these strangers just really take me in, and caress me, um, hug me when I needed to be hugged, and that just paints a fuller picture. Um, and then there are also other individuals along the way who I meet and help me, particularly in one, you know, writing this was one experience. Editing it was another buddy, an, another one, and eventually I, I read my own um, audiobook, and that was also like a purging in and of itself. And in in the audiobook, I cried three times, and I've cried throughout the writing of this fucking thing. Um, <laughs> but what surprised me was that this character Jesus, this teenage boy from Tecumuman, Guatemala really moved me um, and I still remember him to this day um, and he would ride a in some cultures you would call it a tuk-tuk uh, we call it a moto taxi or a, a bici taxi um, he like rides us in front and he was a hustler and he was hustling since forever um, he must have been like 16 and just the hustle is what um, moved me and as immigrants we all know the fucking hustle um, and it's, it's, it's interesting that this is my second reading on the stop. Um, Chino, Patricia, and Carla were coming here to the DMV. Um, they were coming to Alexandria. Um, and it's a trip to tell this crowd that you have probably um, crossed some paths with um, the real Patricia, the real Chino, the real Carla or they're also a metaphor. And 
they are working uh they are here and we're everywhere um and it's fucking sick that i'm here and there are salvi there's i love that you wore the salvi fucking jersey i i love that i like want to cry because this is this is why i wrote you know this book um if you can't see for those live streaming it's um how old are you 12 12 year old kid wearing the uh, the salvi the salvi jersey El Magico, eso, of course. There's only one jersey you buy. Yeah. Or Cienfuegos, tal vez, tal vez. Um, wow, and, and that's why, you know? Um, per capita, this is the most salvi town in the United States. Um, it is about time that we write our own stories and it's the, uh, of course, I'm like, oh, why the why do children holding my book or children in a bookstore really moved me? It's because I was a fucking kid coming here. But um, if you watch, you know, on, on the Jenna show, there were there was a kid outside holding my book in like Times Square when the book dropped. And that just pfft, gutted me. And, and, and I think, I think Chena, Patricia, and Carla need their time as well and that they need to be seen for who they are, which is dope ass fucking human beings, full human beings that had the heart to help somebody else. Resilient human beings, yeah. not victims, right? Yeah. N not, you know, um, people who, who have stayed in the past. These are people, as you said, that we see, we work with, right? That populate, that uplift Washington DC and the DMV. So it's about time that, you know, we are known I've pretty much dedicated my whole, you know, life to that work. So that's why I'm so excited about, you know, Javier's work, the poetry book, the book of poems, and this, you know, next book. And actually, I'm teaching a class right now, and I was like, we're reading it. We're <laughs> reading it. It's assigned, and my students are here. They were very excited to mm. come, you know, see you. Uh, um, so I, I want to piggyback on, you know, in Magico, yeah, number mm -hmm. 11, <laughs> okay? Um, I, you know, followed, you know, um, your, the passage I through Mexico mm -hmm. in the book, right? And um, the way the tortillas worked, right? That, you know, the, the closer it, it got to the United States, the less familiar those tortillas were to a Salvadoran who eats thick tortillas. So I wanted to ask you, and there's other instances, right? La horchata, that's different <laughs> than the horchata we drink, see? The beans. In my, in my friend group, we call it the horchata wars. Oh, the they're, they're Mexican, <laughs> and, and the Savi one is the better horchata. And if you tell me otherwise... <laughs> <laughs> With, without a doubt, it's thicker, right? <laughs> I'm so, not biased at all. You know? <laughs> yeah. and, and we're like, uh, yeah, right, we're, we're Salvis. Um, the beans, right? We all know, like, you know, we eat, our beans are different, right? So also the beans are there. Um, the words, right? There's a uh, um, pajillas, and I I was talking to my colleagues that pajillas in, in other uh, s Latino cultures, Latinx cultures, it means, it means something else. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so in Mexico, it's, it's like bicho as well. Bicho. bicho for us means one thing, for the Caribbeans means something else. Yes. <laughs> so you know, with unapologetically, you know, he drops all these Salvadoran signs, the Salvadoran words, right? I don't think they're even italicized, which I'm grateful they're not because, you know, they're not exotic words. They're just words part of, you know, our culture, right? Um, um, and also like la linea, right? The border. So the border between, you know, cultures, Latinos and so forth. But I want to go back to El Magico since we have here, you know, one of our local heroes. Um, so um, I was interested in how you mark Salvi identity in this book hmm. and how you know was that unconscious was that like something that you were doing through some of the things that I just mentioned right and how does the identity of the child um, Javier Chepito um, how does that identity get transformed in this passage up to the linea um, what what's also in there and I think this is a metaphor as to what it means. And I don't know, like this is from a uh, Salvadoran growing up in California. Um, I think the metaphor in the book 
that was true, but then becomes a metaphor once immigrants make it to this country, is that we have to lie. We have to hide our tongue. We have to hide our voceo, Central Americans. We have to hide our words in order to pass through Mexico. Mexico is perhaps the hardest border to cross, and Mexico is you know, almost 3,000 mile long border in which Central Americans are vilified, um, we are um, prejudiced against, uh, we are murdered, um, and it's very hard to make it through. And I think because of how difficult it is to make it through Mexico, that a lot of Central Americans in California, hopefully did not occur here in the DMV, but we learn to double assimilate. We're not only assimilating uh, into the American culture, but we're also assimilating to the predominant uh, sp Spanish language that's spoken around in, El in, in California that's Mexican Spanish. I have a lot of family members who immigrated here before me who don't use Bocel anymore um, because they got so used to hiding and to blending, which we're very fucking good at, um, that they, if, if you hear them speaking Spanish, they sound Mexican. You would think that they're Mexican. Um, and those are all survivor ta survival tactics that we learn, and it's, again, it's about time that we don't have to do that. And it was on purpose that I don't italicize, it's on purpose that I don't translate, it's on purpose that I, I even use like el cadejo, you know, la carreta chillona. These are things that we grew up with that we forget and we are the fastest growing, second biggest immigrant group in the United States. We passed Puerto Ricans, I think, last year or two years ago. So it's Mexicans than us. You know, it's, it's our fucking time, about fucking time. And, and we're continuing to come here because our homeland is still fucked. Um, and you're about to hear from Hondurans too. You know, this is only the beginning. This is the Central American golden age. And you're seeing it in film, you're seeing it in TV shows, you're seeing it in literature. Um, and it, it, it was less a choice than an honoring of what already is, um, which is we're not, we're not going anywhere. Um, that's how I think, that's how I talk. Uh, caliche is life. <laughs> yes. Um, so you mentioned how, you know, despite the fact that, you know, we're Salvadorans are now like the second, third largest group after Mexicans, which is the large population because of the history. Um, and, and a lot has been said about the invisibilization. It's like a big theoretical concept um, when we talk about um, Salvadorans and Central Americans in the U.S. Why do you think that, you know, there's this persistence that that, you know, c continues, we continue to be erased? I mean, think of the DMV, where, as you mentioned, it's, you know, we're the largest group. Um, <sighs> rare is, I mean, people know pupusas, right? But oftentimes, think of your own contact with people that you see working, you know, every day, the everyday hustle. Why do we continue to be so highly invisibilized, especially in concentrations like this, in, the, in this area, in LA, and so forth? I think it's changing. I think that's also a narrative that, that has to change. Um, we're visible. Um, I guess the question would be like, who are we invisible? To whom are we invisible? I think we have to stop thinking of the whom as well and, and just be like, I'm visible. I look in the mirror every day, there I am. Um, and to part ways. Um, and I think the more we part ways with that is that then we're honoring and centering ourselves more and then in, in that you know I don't, I, I don't know what I'm saying but <laughs> um, yeah it's it's happened it, it's changing and it will continue to change so that's it that's it so <laughs> end of story end of <laughs> invisibilizing we're here we're here to stay for yeah. sure right um, I wanted to go back to to the memoir the genre Right, this is a memoir, uh, life story, um, but sometimes I mean it almost reads like a novel <laughs> um, because it really does grapple your attention, right? And it has a plot, the story, you know, the, the child moving through Mexico, and as you mentioned, right up until you know arriving and and uh, you know meeting up with your parents. 
so is it a memoir or is it <laughs> fiction or how do you negotiate those spaces the biggest compliment is that um you know genre bending i think once if you're a quote-unquote border crosser i think um defined lines you don't really understand um and i've always wanted to create something like this um and i think as a as an artist as a writer i'm always intrigued by genre bending um and it is a memoir it's important to call it a memoir but it also reads like a novel and that's on purpose and now uh, we can talk about the purpose i i like to think of myself uh, like not a capital a activist but as somebody who is consciously trying to make a difference um for immigrants in this country and it's why i i used to think that becoming a history major um that i needed to learn the facts of why salvadorans are here i'm a history major i wanted i used to want to be a, a phd and a historian of salvadoran history um we all know the facts we know the statistics um they're not doing it um and you know we all are shocked into these very shocking um images of immigrants at the border in the worst day of their lives shock value has lost the it's it's value i guess it's that's not doing it um there are movies being created a lot of them not by immigrants themselves that's not fucking doing it so what is hopefully um it is harder for the reader to ignore a kid it is very easy to dismiss an adult telling you a story and americans we have this obsession of helping children oh let's help the kids the kids are dying but we don't remember the adults around them we don't care about the parents let's give the dreamers papers but let's let we let's forget about the parents because they don't matter they they made a choice no we're all the same and maybe maybe this book could do something because this is a kid you look like a bigger asshole if you ignored the kid you really really you really need to have zero empathy in order to not look at the humanity of these people and it's this kid telling you that they're human and it's why it's a memoir and it's why it reads like a novel and it's why it begins on a certain day and it ends on a certain day there are no politics um it's just prose <laughs> um <laughs> thank you i had to do it i had to do it <laughs> um and then you can you can you can take what you will from from what's written there and then fill it in with whatever politics you bring to it but at the end of the day these are just human beings one last question because you said is it prose is it prose is it poetry because it's a very poetic book as well and you've written on a company that tells that story in a different way um how did you negotiate that space of the lyric and the prose and i think i think it flows um the biggest the the best advice i ever got from if there are any writers in here read your work out loud um the editing part of this i always read it out loud i think you know what what people think of lyricism i guess then gets called poetry but it's just reading the stuff out loud if you want it to to sound good r read it out to yourself and if you think it's good then then do it um and i think that's where the lyricism comes from um it takes a lot of time um a slow writer um yeah this this took on paper it took 3 and 1/2 years i think i've been trying to write this book since i started writing when i was 17 and i think unaccompanied um 
it gave me the structure and the bones. It's like you're building a house. It was the framework, and it made me. It made it easier for me to to fill it in, and and on paper too. Like poetry doesn't doesn't take that much white space, um, and but it, it it gave me the kind of like fill in the numbers or paint by numbers, and then it made it easier for me to to fill it in. Beautiful. And if I any of you want to hear um, Javier reading, you can go to. Uh, the Poetry Foundation, I think it is, that has uh, recordings of the poems that, you know, y y you, y you hear him reading, you know, these words, this, this, this concise poetry, right, that is like a mini, mini me of, you know, <laughs> solito, right? But I'm, you know, I'm intrigued by the titles, unaccompanied and then solito. It's that resonance, right, of being unaccompanied. So I know we're getting to, you know, where the audience would, you know, want to ask questions, but I want to go back to El Magico over there because, you know, the gentleman came, El Bicho came to <laughs> see us, right, to, to Javier. Um, you know, your book is so important because it's telling the story of our communities, it's of our immigrants and trying to give them life and, you know, flesh, right? What would you say to a young, I don't know how old you are, but, you know, 12, 12 <laughs> yes. What would you say to El Magico standing over there and, and future... Magicos. Now you're going to make me cry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> um, just to be, be yourself and don't let anybody else tell you otherwise. And you can dream. You can dream big. And if you work hard, you can get there. Um, and just be you. That, that's it, man. And thank you for being here. You really made my day. I hope you know. I hope you know um, that you're moving this 32-year-old man to tears. Because I, I, when I was your age, I wanted a book like this. And I needed a book like this. And y aquí está vos. Y gracias. Gracias, bicho. Thank you for those magical words. Is the, we're, we're like 20 minutes away from ending, and I think we're at the time that you know, we can take questions from you, know, you all. I'm sure you have a lot of questions that you know, we couldn't cover. And I think we're asking people to come to the to podium. The it's to on the, the mic. It's on the left. On the left. Mm -hmm. Please, we invite questions. Hi, friend. Yay. <laughs> um, okay, so you hinted at how you kind of intentionally did this a little bit differently than your first and that you included different people. And you also kind of hinted at using it as a framework. So my question is, in terms of growth from the first to the second publishing, um, what was some of your intention when you first started in terms of things you wanted to repeat or augment and things that you definitely wanted to deviate from or that maybe you felt were left out in the first? Great question. Um, and for Joey watching at home, that was Molly. Hi, Joey. <laughs> <laughs> Joey's my wife. Um, and my best and friend. Best friend. <laughs> um, I really didn't want to get into or overly focus on the violence. Mm. We hear about the violence too much. Um, I think if I'm a critic of my own work of uh, unaccompanied, I, I tap too much into that side for the poetry. And I think that was a learning experience. Um, I wanted to expand um, on the humanity of the people. You know, Chino in, po in my poetry is only a person getting beat up by a border patrol. Mm. That's all he is. And that made me feel bad. Um, and that was like a poem that did a lot for me. You know? and, and in this, um, I wanted to really expand that and not do not replicate what the media does and i think i think i also have to thank um my own work um because i wouldn't have done and made the choices that it made in this book without it um 
and and the main one was that that I didn't want to overly focus on the violence. Gracias. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, good evening. My name is Jennifer. My question for you, Javier, is in writing this and and doing your healing work as well. How did you tap into that part of yourself that is whole and that wasn't broken? Hmm. What was your process to do that to help you write? Um, I have to thank my wife here, um, and my my suegra is here, and my suegro is here, um, because she has had her own trauma, and she has done a lot for her own healing. And when we met, I was tr struggling. And I already had met my now therapist. So it was therapy um, that I started with my therapist on December 2019. And I met my wife on um, March 2020. And it was like these two women who really held me up and allowed me, really made it okay for me to break down. And, and for me to, to suffer and not hide from it. Because I think I was ashamed of going there, and there is no and really telling me over and over that there is no bad, and there is no wrong, there it just is, and really how seeing them accept me, help me accept me, mm -hmm. and help me accept that nine-year-old kid, and I think I talked about the shame that I felt towards this kid, but this kid is powerful. They really made me see him as this super, super, superhero yeah. um, that had unimaginable power. And if I could just tap into his power, this nine-year-old kid that is always going to be with me, he's always going to uh, follow me. Um, and I think for, the out for outsiders, myself included, I used to think, oh, you go to therapy, and it's over. <laughs> like, you, 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 you do it for an X amount of time. I am healed. Fuck that is like taking medicine, but it does not work like that. It's just understanding that this thing is with you for the rest of your life. And, and these people help me. Um, and also, I, I have been in therapy since the seventh grade. So it's not like therapy is the cure-all. I also needed to address this every single day when I woke up. I would try to meditate. Meditate has gone off the wayside. It's, it's not, it doesn't really stick for me. I would go on runs for me running um, or like work out. It's really me desespeja la mente. And I would um, eat healthier. I became vegan for a while. <laughs> I'm a pescatarian now. Um, so you're just like really actively making choices because that choice is that you want to be a better human being. So it's like it, it's an everyday work. You have to work at it every day. And yeah, I, I, I didn't do it alone. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I have two questions. One, uh, one is a very quick uh, factual thing. Argent, uh, I, I'm, I'm uh, with an Argentine background. I hear voceo and I hear vos, and Salvadorans also say vos yeah, instead it, of two. Yeah, it's why um, I also included. Um, we hear in the music too. I love Soda Stereo and I love uh, Vilma Palma e Vampiros, oh. which you can hear the voceo in there. And I think that's why Salvis, at least the Salvis that I grew up with, we love. We love them. Okay. The, the more thoughtful question is, can you imagine, I mean, it, I'm thinking, I think of the way immigrants are looked upon in the United States so negatively today, and we look at the, the, the Puritans who came, who were also, who also fleeing, who were also coming illegally, who were not only the Without king paper. decided? Yeah, the, the the king decided it was a colony after when it was convenient for him, but they didn't come with permission. And I wonder, can you imagine a, a Puritan pilgrim child uh, in the ship? Maybe the the son of a friend that came with a family undergoing something like you wonder what in the sense of there might have been a child that 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 was kind of lost in a great historical migration? I think you're asking if I have empathy for other immigrant children, regardless of the, their race. Yeah, yeah, I do. Um, and I think every 
honest and good human being would have empathy for another child immigrant but also I want to expand that and that you should have empathy for not only children in immigrants you know and and what's hard is that there's always race in it you can see the treatment of Ukrainian children and adults it was way different than the treatment for Central Americans they're white black blonde, Asians yeah. yeah and and so all I'm asking is for empathy yeah. you know all across the board yeah. thank you okay thank you well, I don't really have a question, but um, I was also at around nine when I moved here. Sure. Uh, when I moved with my sister. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I want to say, like, reading your book, well, I'm listening in an audio book. It's, um, I love it, and I'm sorry, but I express myself better in Spanish. No, but really, in Espanol. Lo que quiero decir es que gracias. O sea, gracias por oh. hablar del Salvador de esa manera, de nuestra gente, de nuestra manera de hablar, de nuestra cultura, nuestra comida de una manera tan bonita, porque siento de que yo hablo y se va perdiendo esto, ¿no? Sí. Aquí, perdiendo Exacto. nuestra manera de ser, nuestra cultura y, claro. y se va a verte es como tú, chica. ¡Qué chivo! Sí. So, no, gracias. Gracias, vos. Gracias, gracias. gracias. No, y gracias por estar aquí, gracias por traerlo. ¿Cómo, cómo, cómo te llamas vos? ¿Él? Oh, oh, ¿Ustedes oh, tres? Yo, ¿David? ¿David? Yeah. ¿Y vos? Rosy. ¿Rosy? Erika. ¿Y de qué parte son? De El Salvador, de, bueno, de, de San Isidro Cabañas, departamento de Cabañas. Oh, nunca he ido a Cabañas. Sí, no tiene que ir, o sea. No. Vamos a ir. Por favor. De hecho, de hecho hice pupusas y no las traje, pero la Ah, no, para la próxima. Y claro. no, no otra pregunta, pero verdad, agradecerte inmensamente este libro hermoso. Lo escuchamos con él todos los días cuando vamos a le, para la escuela. Oh my god. Sí. sí Entonces, sí. es algo sí. tan bonito, nos conecta y hace que um, viajemos hacia allá. Entonces, él con tu libro está aprendiendo más de lo que yo día con día no le enseño y quiero que él aprenda y que vea sí. nuestra cultura, nuestra comida, nuestra manera de hablar, de querer a la gente. Sí. Entonces, gracias, de verdad, gracias sí. inmensa. Tu libro es maravilloso no. y hace que pues estos niños sean Se mejores, ¿no? Sí. Y sos un ejemplo, ¿verdad? No, sí. ¿verdad? no gracias. gracias. Pero hay, hay, no, tenemos que tomar una foto después. Por favor, sí, claro, sí. Claro. Yeah. <laughs> um, hi. Um, so I, my parents were um, immigrants from El Salvador, but I was born here. Um, but I'm also a huge uh, aspiring writer. And my question to you is, how do you think that, like, as obviously I didn't go through what my parents went through, and I didn't go through what you went through, but I, I want to use my voice and my writing abilities to like tell their story or I guess like speak on like the immigrant experience and the experience of being Salvadorian and like coming to America and being just like Hispanic in America even if you were born here I guess my question is like how do you think the best way for us as like family of immigrants is to use our voices um it's a great question um I think uh, what has happened a lot and in in my trauma mm -hmm. I would and if you haven't already then that's great but a lot of people who are holding their trauma will tell you that you can't write especially if, like your family members I don't know this is hard fucking topics we don't want to share them yeah we absolutely do not want to share them mm -hmm. to ourselves we don't want to share them to other people mm -hmm. not even our own family members yeah. um, and so and it, it's okay to pry. Mm -hmm. It's okay to pry and oftentimes, but also pry at your own risk. Yeah. And if you can hold that, mm -hmm. you know, I would I highly advise a therapist <laughs> and somebody who's a professional who can hold that space for you. Yeah. Because as children of immigrants or immigrants ourselves, we are asked the impossible. We are asked to have superpowers and hold the shit for our parents. And you don't have to. You don't have to, and and you you can choose to if you can. You don't have to do it now. You don't have to do it ever. But if you don't, but if you do choose that path, there should be somebody there holding you, and 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 that's not gonna change them either. Everybody's their own healing vessel, and you can't force somebody into telling you a certain story. 
So it's just a balancing act. And just I, I, I just be aware of what you are doing yeah. and, and understanding them and understanding yourself and, and honoring your needs yeah. as well. You know? I don't know if that's, that was helpful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Buenas noches. Buenas noches. Um, lo primero que vi fue la pulsera de, del mal de ojo ahí. El mal de ojo. <laughs> <laughs> Para que um, no me hagan mal de ojo. <laughs> <laughs> Yo siempre la tenía también. Um, so, I, I'll go back and forth between languages, but... Um, uh, Yo vine a los siete años, después de tres intentos con tres coyotes diferentes. Wow. Um, y cuando vine a los siete años, um, tuve que hacer muchas cosas para asimilarme a esta cultura, para asimilarme a, a este país, incluyendo quitándome el acento salvadoreño, poniéndome un lápiz debajo de la lengua y llorar enfrente de un espejo mm. para que se me quitara. Mm -hmm. Y ahora, que tengo 25 años, me doy cuenta que quiero salir de las sombras mm -hmm. y quiero que también mi voz se escuche. Mm -hmm. Pero de qué manera práctica puedo hacer eso? Mm. Mm. Esa es la pregunta. Sí. <risa> lo estás haciendo. Uh -huh. lo, ya lo estás haciendo. El reco reconocer que eso es lo que vos querés hacer y que esa sos vos es el comienzo. Y también lo mismo, terapeuta. <risa> y, y que alguien que sepa uh -huh. y, y que esto no lo puedes hacer sola. Uh, necesitas ayuda. De, o un profesional, sí, ideally, sí, sí. y, y, ahí, y ahí, ahí está, esa es como la, ya hiciste esa decisión uh -huh. y ahora seguí, va a ser duro, pero vos, vos echale para adelante y, y, y uno sabe cuando uno está haciendo las cosas buenas, y uno sabe cuando las cosas que uno hace le van a ayudar a alguien y, y vos sabes, así que vos, vos, vos seguí ese camino y y, de, y vos ayudándote a vos misma le vas a ayudar a, a, a tu familia a los que están alrededor tuyo so, no, no sé, no, so, solo te puedo decir mm -hmm. y, y todo caso es diferente claro. so, todo indivi individuo es su propio individuo y caso es diferente para mí me ayudó esto y esto y esto y esto tal vez a vos no te va a ayudar mm -hmm. um, pero hay que tratar todo sí, so, sí. So. Pero bueno, gracias ¿y de dónde sos vos? Eh, nací en San Salvador pero soy de bueno, tengo memorias de San Vicente, wow. de Morazán, San Miguel y Cojutepeque. Wow. Adentro Cojutepeque. Adentro. <risa> Bien. Wow. Gracias, bro. No, gracias a ti. Sí. Hello. Um, I just want to say I'm a really big fan. I'm a teacher about two miles from here. A uh, majority of my students from Central America, they in inspire me every day. We've read many of your poems. Uh, I've literally seen students cry after reading your poems um, and using them to write about their own experiences. Uh, I want to brag of a student, former student here is about to graduate from Georgetown University this year. Sick. Um, and I just want to thank you for the difference you've made in uh, the lives of so many students. And I can't wait to read this book with them. And I guess my next question is, what kind of questions would you want um, my students to grapple with as they read this book? Or what maybe message might you want to deliver to them before they read it? Hmm. So this is going to sound obnoxious. <laughs> but um, having a big press fucking helps. Uh, and there is a, a sheet that gets attached, uh, like an educator's sheet, with all the questions that are already discussed with, wow. with somebody at Penguin. And and you can um, I'll talk to me after. Please, thank um, you. There there are a lot, there are a lot, and there are a lot of other articles that we've discussed that are also part of this. There's video aspects to it. There's like a whole conversation that if I were to be in the classroom, this is the way that I could be in the classroom is through this worksheet that we worked. Um, and a, and a, it's it's a blessing um, that that my team at Hogarth and a and a Penguin knew to do this. Um, and so yeah, there, there's a lot, but just me telling you now is that don't, there's a fine balance between, again, like we, we want to help, but sometimes, here, I'll tell you this story. 
everybody wanted me to read Enrique's journey when I was an immigrant. Okay. Everybody did. I would avoid it because I wasn't ready. I would avoid it, and when I finally did read it, it was re-traumatizing. Mm -hmm. It was one of the worst episodes that I've ever had. Um, and and so th that's that's a, a story for every educator in here and every every family member, every friend. We know that shit's out there. We will find it. Um, but there's also that balance of representation. Mm -hmm. Like we do need the representation in the classroom as well. Um, and, and that is um, what hopefully like a worksheet uh, really mm -hmm. gets, gets to do the balancing act mm -hmm. um, because it's difficult. And again, you're teaching in a, in a room where what works for one student is not gonna work for another. And so it's, it's difficult to find what like that spectrum um, so I don't know. <laughs> I guess my answer is like, I don't know. Um, but, but thank you for, for, for doing the, the work that you do. And we need educators who are asking these questions. Mm. So I hope that more educators are like that. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Thank and I'll you. share widely with yeah. the whole s district. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Awkwardly, I'm going to make this really short. Um, this is the end of this kind of session. But I do want to give, if both of you want to, Give maybe something else to read, something else to look at. If you have any thoughts for another place to go after this book, that that would be lovely. Just that people have another another place to learn, hmm. another place to hear stories. La, la profe. <laughs> I'm like, pass it off. <laughs> pass it off. I'm sure you have a whole list, but I think um, this is a really great time for um, U.S. Central American literature. There are, you know, there's Javier's work, but there are a lot of young Salvis, Guatemalans, Hondurans, and uh, people that are, you know, getting published. I always say, you know, also go beyond, you know, what's being printed by, you know, pr big presses because there are so many voices out there, right? Go to the, you know, poetry jams, the spoken word performances. Here in the D.C. area, we have a really thriving live, you know, scene, right? Um, go to Orchata Zine, right? There's a zine that publishes the work of you know young artists in the DMV. So um, there's a there's a lot of stuff. Is La Piscucha here too? La, uh, la Piscucha Zine? No. no. It's on it, yeah. It, uh, go online, right? Yeah. Plug in Salvi, Salvadoran, American. You you know all these you know um, key keywords. Um, but yes, there's a lot of stuff. I, uh, too much probably to recommend. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, there's also an anthology called Somewhere We Are Human, uh, run by uh, Reina Grande, um, that just came out I think last month. Uh, that is has work fought by a lot of undocumented or formerly undocumented people. So there's that on on the immigration aspect. Um, there's also again uh, e exciting um, Salvadoran voices coming up. And I want to shout out um, Loma Loma Soto, Christopher Loma Soto's um, poetry book um, just came out last month as well, Diaries of a Terrorist. And this is a, a queer uh, Salvadoran. Uh, and I think we also, that is the next step. You know, the, the, the queer voices, non-binary voices that are also coming out of the isthmus. Um, and there's a lot of always everywhere is always the queers who do the protesting first and and in my country um the fiercest uh, activists are 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 queer and and they're doing the work that is unimaginable to me in a country that literally wants the queer community dead um and so i would i would go there first um, um so christopher christopher loma soto um diaries of a terrorist Alrighty, thank you both for all those recommendations. Um, some quick news updates on PMP events really quick and then we're gonna do the whole clapping and then the whole signing. So here we are, <laughs> because already people are like, I need to clap. Um, <laughs> so um, upcoming Latinx events. Uh, Sandra Cisneros is on the 14th. The Latinx Caribbean panel is on the 18th and Angie Cruz is on the 24th. If you want any more information, it's on the website. Go for it. Have so much fun with that. And then let's give a round of applause for these two. <laughs> All righty. Yeah. So.
if you want to have a book signed, 